Welcome back to Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. I'm personal financial planner, columnist, and financial therapist, Rick Kaler. Research tells us that 90% of all financial decisions are made emotionally, not logically. For nearly four decades, I've been helping people make better money decisions. So what makes my financial worldview different from most financial experts? I blend the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Good money decisions are not just about the money. So let's get started with today's episode. Welcome back to another edition. I'm going to talk on something I don't think I've talked on before. And it is a concept that originally came from motivational interviewing. The name of the author escapes me right now. Good evidence that these talks aren't scripted, right? <laughs> the the other resource is a book that I can remember the authors because it's called Facilitating Financial Health. It was a book that I co-authored with uh, Brad and Ted Klontz. And this is the concept. I actually don't think these words are used in facilitating financial health, but it's something that we've commonly said, is that when you meet resistance, you're moving too fast. And I'm framing this in the context of someone that you're talking to and that someone where maybe you have just given them some advice. And if a person is in the action stage, which comes from the uh, stages of change by Protraska, which are pre-contemplative, meaning I don't even know that there's an issue, to contemplative in that, okay, uh, I'm accepting there could be an issue, I'm kind of aware of this, to preparation to change, to the action stage where we really change, to the relapse stage, which is normal in any change, and then to the final stage of this becoming a new behavior. <clears throat> Those are the, the stages of change. And when we, uh, when we hit resistance in somebody, in other words, if we give advice and the person follows the advice, they were in the action stage. They were ready to take action. But typically, and this, this isn't uh, from research, it's from um, more observation, only about 20% of us are ready to take action. Um, especially when, you know, when we go to a professional and we say we have this problem and we're given advice, there's much higher chance that we're in the action stage that, that will act on that advice. But if we're given advice when the uh, professional looks at one thing and says, well, here's my advice here, but I see something else here, and you might consider doing this, that's where we have a much higher chance of being resistant, of not being in the action phase. And I know it's a common misperception that people who seek financial advice or uh, um, financial therapy or uh, a professional of any kind, that when they get the advice, they're going to do it. Um, this, is, this is more of a misconception on the professional's side. I run into this all the time with my students at uh, Golden Gate University, which uh, sometimes are just like, it's so hard to believe. You mean people will come to me for advice and when I give them the advice, they won't do it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to suggest that happens more time than not. And, um, you know, often what the professional is hoping for is that they'll give this advice, the client will just express 
gratitude for the professional's wisdom and write them a big check. So I'm suggesting that's uh, wishful or magical thinking. Now, what is common is that the professional will probably write the check. Or not the professional, the client will probably write the check. But it is super common for the client to resist the advice rather than embrace it. And resistance can be seen in um, the actions of a client becoming argumentative or they interrupt the professional with a but this or but that and really um, don't take time to, to hear what the professional is saying. Uh, they may become just very dis dismissive of the advice. Well, this is why it's not going to work and this is why I've tried that before and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, on the other hand, the client could be very um, agreeable to the advice. Their heads could be nodding. They could say, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go do that. And then when you get together again, uh, the client has failed to take any action. They may have even forgotten what the advice was. So that, that is so common. Now, oftentimes the professional's response to the client's resistance, uh, it can be manifold, but one is that they can assume they have not clearly communicated their ideas and decide to take another approach, another tact, um, or often they'll become more direct and confrontational. <laughs> I, I'm reminded I was in France and I was in a shop. I think maybe it was a tea shop or something. And some Americans came in and they said, um, I'd like some uh, cheddar cheese, please. And the Frenchman <clears throat> behind the counter was uh, like, je ne comprends pas, saying, you know, I don't understand what you're saying. And the Americans in a louder voice said, I would like some cheddar cheese. And, and the Frenchman was like, I don't, know what you're saying. Of course, he said that in French. And the response was this, I would like some cheddar cheese. Now, they just ratcheted up the uh, tone and tenor of their voice using the, the same words, thinking that was going to help <laughs> non-English speaking Frenchmen to understand. So this is kind of a similar approach that a professional can use um, when a client becomes resistant, they can just say the same thing. Uh, they could say it louder. They could say it uh, more directly and more confrontationally. Well, rather than the client hearing them, just like the French cheese guy, this can uh, lead to an escalation where the client becomes more resistant and the advisor becomes more direct or confrontational and the client is even more resistant, uh, defending and going through why they disagree with the, the action. And it can just become a cycle right? Increasing resistance, increasing confrontation. There's research and, and a lot of this can be found in chapter 10 of facilitating financial health. 
um, so I'm not going to give you the sites, but there's research that shows that client resistance triggers more confrontational behavior in the professional. This is normal. And that the confrontation from, from the professional actually fuels more resistance. All of this decreases the likelihood of meaningful change or that the client's going to act on the advice. So as a result, a lot of financial professionals at this point will <clears throat> label the clients as difficult. There's all sorts of reactions that they could take to that, but sometimes they will even suggest that <clears throat> they are not a good fit with the client, which yeah, is actually true, and refer them out to another. <clears throat> uh, probably worse is that they... Um, recede or uh, are locked in some type of unspoken conflict with the client that can go on for months and years. Well, the truth is that there are no difficult clients. There are only professionals who have exhausted their approaches and, and run out of tools. Now, this is not said in a shaming way. Um, a lot of professionals don't want to take the time and effort and do the personal interior work that it takes to be with clients that are resistant. Um, resistance can really trigger the professional's, um, trigger them emotionally. We call that uh, counter-transference, where they can trigger within the professional some area that the professional hasn't done a lot of emotional work around. Um, maybe the resistance triggers the professional's need to be heard. When, it's, when the advice is triggering the client's need to be heard. So... <clears throat> It, it does to, to be with clients um, that are not in the action stage really requires some inner work, some emotional work on behalf of the professional. So, and, I, and another thing, and I didn't really mean to get into this, but just giving advice itself is often not helpful. And I know that that always comes as a surprise to professionals that are like, wait a minute, Rick, the client's coming to me for advice. Well, while that's true, it is the way and the timing that the advice is given that is key. Advice does not have to be demanding or, or direct. It can be uh, done in a way like, well, would you like some feedback around that? Or would you like to know what other clients I've had have done in this situation? Or if I was you and I'm not you, this might be something I would try. But always letting the client know that they are in charge. Nobody likes to be told what to do. Um, resistance is just so normal. So a skilled advisor, a skilled professional will recognize that when they meet res resistance, it indicates they're moving to fast. So it's critical that the advisor pauses, steps back rather than doubling down and, and <laughs> like the, the Americans in the tea shop saying, well, let me put this louder and more succinct. They pause, step back and understand, okay, in this moment, 
the client doesn't feel heard. I am moving too fast. So client resistance is an indication that maybe I need to improve my listening skills, especially when I think I've heard the client and the client saying, no, you haven't. It doesn't really matter what we think. The client is saying, I don't feel heard. So we need to improve our listening skills so that a client does feel truly understood. And it's hard for a professional to improve listening or to listen deeply when they themselves are triggered, when it's bringing up difficult emotions and uh, past uh, traumas that even the professional may not be aware of. <clears throat> so to, to those of you listening who are clients and not professionals, I want to say this, that resistance to advice is nothing to be ashamed of. It is natural and normal. Uh, according to uh, Facilitating Financial Health in it, we write that our subconscious brain, which hasn't received a significant update in thousands of years, is wired to resist change. Our brain tends to overvalue the status quo. Our brain tends to underestimate the potential benefits of change. All right, so that's kind of normal. Well, why? Why are we so resistant? Why are we so acceptance of the status quo uh, and not recognizing perhaps the benefits to change especially in the manner that's been suggested. I mean, sometimes I just want to take a pill. <laughs> I remember when I was in, in group therapy, the therapist would uh, say, what do you need? And I would say, I have no clue what I need. Finally, I get so frustrated. I said, why don't you invent a pill so I could take it? And then I would know what I need. Um, so, Oftentimes, the path to change, we hope that it's far easier or a completely different path than what's being suggested. Why might that be? Well, it could be that I might want to avoid uncomfortable emotions that arise because of the suggested solution. <clears throat> It could be that I want to avoid um, unresolved painful experiences. So in IFS speak, we're talking about those exiled parts of ourselves that have unfinished business. Uh, they were wounded, oftentimes at a young age, and uh, protective parts of us have said we're not going there. <clears throat> and so they become walled off. And when, when those are hit, it's a trigger. It it's, uh, can bring up immediate resistance from the protector. It's the protective part of us that is resistant because we don't want the system be, to be overwhelmed by this, this pain or trauma. So this is why it's important for financial professionals to obtain the skills necessary to facilitate financial change. And for the professional to obtain those skills is going to mean that they look inward to themselves to uh, facilitate their own change, to visit their own unresolved issues. And I know that's completely counter to what most financial professionals would hope for, and that is, well, come on, can I just learn the techniques? Do I really have to, to turn myself inside out? And of course, you know the answer. I've said this before, that 
a professional can only take a client as far as they've taken themselves. Okay, so to you listening that are clients and not professionals, it's equally important for you as a client to know what's happening within yourself. Why? Well, there are a lot more inexperienced professionals who will focus on demanding change, on giving more advice, on getting more confrontational than those who understand the dynamic and will back up and help facilitate the change within you. So you, you may have to deal with this type of professional um, uh, recognizing this within yourself so you can know what to ask for or what you need. So by understanding your own internal dynamics as a client can really be valuable. So when you notice resistance within yourself, wow, that professional just said this, I can just feel my walls going up. I can feel all the excuses and the buts. I, I see this resistance within myself. It's an indication that the professional is moving too fast, right? Um, you may not even hear what's going to come after that. You're just aware of this resistance. So this is a an opportunity to get curious about yourself. Now, um, this can happen, and we've talked about this before, when somebody says something and you feel a flash of anger, okay? That person has not made you feel anything. You are choosing to feel this anger, and this anger can be coming from who knows what, but it's legitimate. It's legitimate that a person is feeling anger, and you don't have to know the reason. So in similar manner, when you feel resistance, it probably is an indication you haven't felt heard, but you don't need to know the reason that you're feeling resistance. It's enough to know that you're feeling resistance. And when that happens, it's an opportunity for you to let the facilitator know, the professional know, that you need to stop that they need to stop, that you're just not in a place to hear more advice on this particular topic, that you're feeling some resistance and you're curious about that, right? If you just tell them I'm feeling resistance to what you're saying, <laughs> they may take this as, oh, I've done something wrong. I need to and the way they go into the loop of reframing it or, or doubling down. So let them know that I am having resistance and I'm really curious about this choice to be feeling this resistance. It's nothing that you have done, but I'm curious about this. Could you help me? Just kind of process this uh, as to why, because I don't even understand why I'm feeling this resistance. I'm just feeling it, <clears throat> okay? If the advisor has some skills, they can stop and kind of help you hang out with this or process it. Now, the chances are that this advisor doesn't have those skills because you're having to do this for yourself. So you need, may need to pause the entire discussion and bookmark it or say, you know, let me go think about that and uh, maybe we can address it next time. Or just put a pause, put a bookmark in this. And then for you to go and to take some time to process for yourself and there's a number of ways to process. If you're a meditator, you can choose meditation to see what's coming up. If you're an IFS person, you can um, do some um, parts meditation. And I don't know if I've 
said this before, I'm trying to find the book. Um, the Daily Parts Meditation Practice by Michelle Glass is a great book to uh, help uh, you facilitate your own process of getting clear with the parts of yourself. Um, another thing that can be very helpful is journaling. So just taking some time to get clear as to where your resistance is coming from. Another thing you can do is to get uh, support from a trusted friend. Uh, let them be a sounding board. It will be important to have a friend that's non-judgmental and not into giving advice or solutions. Um, and of course, a financial therapist could help or even a, a, a psychotherapist. So with this, you can potentially get enough clarity to go back to the professional and ask more of what you need or um, ask more questions or even clear it up um, or come up with, with some different solutions that work for you. So the uh, bottom line of all this is it's, it's really crucial to be sensitive and aware of instances when someone resists your advice and this can be just in general, right? You don't even have to be a financial professional, right? When you give suggestions and you get resistance, that's something to pay attention to. It's also equally important to pay attention to that resistance within yourself when someone is giving you advice. When resistance is there, it's a clear sign that someone in the conversation is moving too fast. And it's essential to either ask for space for yourself to step back or as the advice giver um, to recognize, whoops, I am moving too fast and to slow everything down. This is a case where going slower means ultimately going faster. The goal is typically to, to change in a manner that provides a solution to the problem uh, when we're stuck. Um, and barreling on when we have huge amount of resistance coming at us or coming up within us is, is not going to be successful. I hope this was uh, helpful. And if you want to know more, uh, chapter 10 of Facilitating Financial Health will go into this a little deeper and give you some more ideas. You can also read Motivational Interviewing. Um, honestly, I've never read it. I, I was, was actually, it was suggested to me I don't read it because it's a heavy, heavy read. So um, I guess what you could say is I've taken the cliff notes from it and we try to make it uh, digestible in facilitating financial health. Okay, thank you for joining me and take care and I look forward to being with you next week. Thanks for joining me, Rick Kaler, for another episode of Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. This is where I combine the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Remember, every financial behavior, whether it appears illogical to you or others, makes perfect sense when we understand the underlying beliefs, feelings, and thoughts. Sign up for my weekly blog at financialawakenings.com. I hope you'll join me again for our next episode.